so as Sean said, my name's Carl. I work at Jobber with various other people that are also here. Uh, if you want to contact me after this, you can find me either on LinkedIn or just send me an email. Um, so let's dive into it. Um, so the definition of scope, uh, Wikipedia defines scope as uh, a name, the scope of name binding is the region of a computer program where the binding is valid. Um, that's a bit of an opaque definition in my opinion. Um, one I prefer is that scope is an area of code where a variable or function name can be used without an error being thrown. Uh, the important thing to remember about scope is that it's all about where to find things in your code. Um, so location matters. Um, so why scope is important is it means we can write code like this and have it not only work without any errors being thrown, but also work in a way that we would expect. Um, so in this code, you can see we're defining three variables, all with the name x, um, which is maybe not good coding practice, but you can do it. Um, the reason you can do it, uh, as we'll find out later, is because all these variables exist inside different scopes. Uh, so there's two uh, types of scope. There's lexical scope. And lexical scope, what's important is where in the source code the variable is defined. And that is quite literally like where, what line number it's defined in. Uh, so going back to this example, the fact that this is defined here and not here, that's important. Uh, the second type is dynamic scope. And dynamic scope works um, with the state of the program at runtime when a name is encountered. Um, examples of dynamically scoped languages are Emacs, Lisp, and actually Bash. I'm not going to talk about dynamic scope today because JavaScript is a lexically scoped language. And to understand scope in JavaScript, I find it useful to think of a compile time and a runtime, even though as an interpreted language, JavaScript doesn't have discrete compile time or runtimes in the same way that C++ or Java do. So the two main scopes that you'll encounter in JavaScript are the global scope and the function scope. Um, so the global scope might also be referred to as the window scope. It's basically the highest level of scope that you can have. Um, so any variable declared outside of a function automatically goes on the global scope. Um, so for instance, if we take these three code examples, they all do pretty similar things, but the output will all be different. Um, so in this first example, if we think of ourselves as a compiler, we're scanning the code, we see this var keyword. Um, so what we're going to do is we're basically going to create a new variable in the global scope. We don't know what it is yet. We find that out at runtime. But we know that we have this variable, and it's called x, and it exists in the global scope. And then we see this function keyword, and so we create a function give it the name foo, and that function also exists in the global scope. Um, and then those are the only keywords that exist in this code. So at that point, we'd be done. Um, but if we take a look at this code example, same thing happens. We create this x in the global scope. We create this foo in the global scope. But then we also have this parameter to the function. And when you have that, what happens is uh, you then kind of recurse into the function scope of foo, and you create a variable x in the function scope. Um, and so then uh, we'll see at runtime, but that x and this x are, they might have the same name. Again, not great coding practice, but they're actually not the same thing. So now if we switch over to thinking at runtime, um, when we invoke this foo function, uh, we end up at this line. Now we're in the scope of the foo function. And uh, we have this variable x. And we'll ask the scope of foo, do you know what this variable x is? And scope of foo won't, because we didn't define it in that function. Um, and so at this point, uh, you could have two choices, depending on what language you're in. You could either throw a, an error and say, I don't know what this variable x is, um, so stop running. Or what JavaScript does is we then basically recurse to the next scope up, which in this case would be the global scope. 
And the global scope does know what x is because we defined it here. Um, and at this point, we know it's 1. So we retrieve it and then pass it to the alert function and then alert 1. Um, and this function does almost the same thing, except we get that variable x from the global scope. We then increment it. And then we'll write that variable back to the global x. Um, so this first alert, we alert 1. Then we call this function increment x. It's now 2. So then on this alert, we'll alert 2. And at that point, x is now 2 in the global scope. So any other code down here, uh, if you're going to use x, you better expect it to be 2, not 1. With this function here, um, we enter the foo scope. And we ask for this variable x, and we ask the scope of foo. But in this case, we do know what x is, because it's defined in the scope of foo because uh, we define it in the method definition. So instead of getting the global x, we get the x from the scope of foo, and then we increment that x and write it back. And that's now 2. So this code will alert 1. We call foo uh, with no return value. And then we alert 1 again. So 1, so sorry, x remains 1 in the global scope, regardless of what this function does to its x variable. Um, so the next important type of scope in JavaScript is block scope. And this, uh, you, you'll usually encounter this if you're using let instead of a var. So here we have two functions. Uh, one of them will run and not throw any errors. And one of them will throw an error. Um, so does anyone have a guess as to which one will work and, which, and why it will work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Um, so in JavaScript, the var keyword uh, creates a variable either globally or locally to an entire function, regardless of block scope. Whereas what let does is it creates a variable which is limited in scope to the block statement or expression on which it is used. Um, so if we can unpack that a little bit, in this function, we see this var i. So we create that on the function scope of foo. Um, and so then once we're outside of this for loop, we say return i, we know what i is, and then we just return it and we continue on. But in this function, because we use let instead of var, we basically kind of create this next area of scope, which only exists for this for loop. So when we're inside the for loop, we know what i is because it exists in that scope. But as soon as we come outside the for loop, uh, we don't know what it is because the scope of bar doesn't know what it is because it's not defined on that scope. So this function would actually throw an exception. Um, so something to watch out for with JavaScript scope. So here we have this function foo. Um, we assign a variable x, the value 1, but we don't declare it. And uh, pretend this is all the code we have. So this variable x is not actually defined anywhere. So when we call this function, um, again, what do, we, what do we think is going to happen versus what would we want to have happen? Um, so what we would want to have happen is an exception being thrown, saying that this variable is not defined. We don't know what it is, so we can't uh, assign anything to it. But we'll, unfortunately, what actually happens is that uh, first, we ask foo, do you know what this variable x? It doesn't, because it doesn't exist in that scope. So we recurse out to the global scope, ask if the global scope knows what this variable x is. It also doesn't, because x was not defined there. But JavaScript does this thing where it tries to be helpful, although it's more like helpful, and that it basically will say, no, I don't know what this is, but here, I'll just create this new variable, and it'll be undefined, and then I'll give it to you, and you can define it. Um, so this code would actually log 1, and then we would have this new global variable x um, that would exist for the rest of the runtime. And that's not great, because then you pollute the global namespace unexpectedly. And the way to avoid this is just to use strict mode. Um, so if you use strict mode, uh, this throws an exception, and you can write the code properly. Um, so let's 
move on to closure. That was a very brief introduction to scope. Um, so again, Wikipedia states that closure is a record storing a function together with an environment where the environment is a mapping storing each free variable of the function with the value or reference to which the name was bound when the closure was created. Um, depending on your background in compiler theory and programming language design, that might make sense to you. Uh, I find it, again, rather opaque and unapproachable. Um, a better definition, I find, is uh, Kyle Simpson's definition, which is that closure is when a function remembers its lexical scope even when the function is executed outside of that lexical scope. Uh, so the important thing to remember here is a function being executed outside of the lexical scope, but still having access to its lexical scope. That like, really is the essence of closure. Um, and in order to have closure in a language, you need two things. You need lexical scope, and you need first class functions, um, both of which JavaScript has. So therefore, JavaScript has closure. I don't know if you could design a language which has lexical scope and first class functions and doesn't have closure. I think it would be very bizarre if that could exist. Um, so let's take a look at what is not closure before we see an example. Um, so a nested function uh, is not closure in and of itself. Uh, nested functions are often used to create closure, um, but they don't, they're not sufficient to get closure by themselves. So this example, uh, we have this function foo, and then within that, a nested function bar. And then we invoke that function bar, and then we return. And that's just defining a nested function and then executing it. That's not closure. Here, we have a call to set timeout, and we're passing an anonymous function into that set timeout. Um, this anonymous function will be defined on the scope of set timeout, and then uh, one second later will be called. Again, that's not closure. That's just an anonymous function existing in the scope of set timeout. Anonymous functions can be used to create closure, but they're not closure in and of themselves. Um, so here we have an example of something which is closure. Um, so we have this add function, and then within the scope of that function, we have this add to x function, and then we return this add to x function. And the important thing to note here is we're returning this add to x function, but we're not invoking it within the scope of add where it's defined. Um, when we eventually invoke it, it's here. Uh, first we call add with one, and then we get this add to x function back, and then we immediately invoke it here, passing another one in. Uh, but where are we executing this add to x function? We're actually executing it in the global scope. Um, and this code will work fine. It doesn't throw any exceptions. It's just a fancy way to do addition. Um, but the reason it works is that this add to x function uh, will know about its scope. And because of the way scope in JavaScript works, uh, it has access to its own scope, but it can also access the enclosing scope of add, where this x variable is defined. And so that's why uh, we can execute that function in the global scope, and it can still no x, even though we didn't actually pass x directly to it when we invoke it. Um, so if you want to get super technical, we would say uh, we are closing over x, where x is a free variable. Um, but you don't necessarily need to know that terminology to understand what closure is. And the reason, well, one of the reasons closure is important is it gives us uh, what some people call the module pattern. Um, kind of a way to give JavaScript public and private methods, even though JavaScript language doesn't have public and private methods in the same way that like Java or C++ do. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, we're defining this anonymous function, um, and then we're defining some things inside it, and then we are immediately executing it. Um, so that's a pattern known as immediately invoked function execution, or uh, iffy. And the reason we want to immediately execute it is because we want to set up this uh, scope. And this is basically, so we want to set up the scope and then we want to return a closure over that scope. So what this does is now that we're inside this scope here, we are isolated from the global scope. Uh, we still technically have access to the global scope if we want it, but 
anything defined in here is not available to the global scope unless we expose it through a closure. So you can see, uh, basically we're just making this public API and we're exposing two functions, print and square. And then this print function calls this private print helper function. And so when we're outside here calling uh, library.print, uh, we're in the global scope. And the global scope doesn't know about this private print function. But uh, public API, or the thing that we've called library, it does know about that private print function because it's a closure and it has access to its uh, like own private scope. So that's one of the reasons closure is important is because it allows us to have this public interface on these private helper functions, and that's a exceedingly useful thing to have when you're writing code. Um, so, so that's that's it for me. Uh, some resources. Kyle Simpson uh, wrote a book called "You Don't Know JS." Uh, it's available for free online. It's uh, really great. Uh, he also teaches a course on frontendmasters.com. If you have uh, access to that, uh, it's called G Deep JavaScript Foundations. Um, he goes way more in depth into scope and closures and a bunch of other things. Um, otherwise, the MDN documentation is pretty good also. Um, so, any questions? Can you go back two slides on this? Uh, One more? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's basically we're returning this function object and, and the scope of that function also. Yeah, yeah. But this is something that's really puzzled me about JavaScript. Um, is you've got this functional aspect of this language, which mm -hmm. I th I've always thought was about avoiding side effects, and then you've got these aspects of the language which seem to lend themselves to side effects. <sighs> is, is, why is this? It, was it designed this way? Is, it, is, it, is this with intent, or is it, this just the way it's evolved? Um, um, to it, or? I mean, maybe a bit of both. I don't, I'm not super familiar with the history of JavaScript. I know. It was originally built in like a week or something, and it's kind of taken a while to get to maturity. Um, but like it, it was designed to have lexical scope and first-class functions, so like therefore it kind of has to have closure. Um, you're right in that you can kind of write both. You could write functional code in JavaScript and not. You could I think you could write it in a way where you don't have side effects, but you can also write just standard like procedural code also. Um, so like I don't really have an answer to your question other than it's, that's just kind of the way it is. I was just going just gonna to speak directly to that again. I'm not a functional expert or even a JavaScript expert. But in this case here, this is, just, this is curing. There, there is no actual side effects. You're actually calling, the fun calling two different functions. You're first calling add to set up a new fun like you're, you're getting a new function in return, yeah. and then you're calling that like the return function. So there is no actual side effects in this case here. Right. You know, you know what I mean? If is you it do it correctly, there's no side effects. But you well, it, it, in, in this code here, there is no side effects, and you, it's, it, it's not doing anything else. It's not changing, uh, what do you call, internal state, like separately from you, right? You are creating a function and then calling that function. There's no output to a database, no output to a file, no output to a console or whatever, right? That, that, that's the definition of, of, of like functional, as, as I understand. Does that make sense? I don't know. Sorry, is that anyone who wants to have anything to add? Yeah, yeah I mean, th that, that's true. This code itself doesn't have a side effect. But you could, like I could define some global variable here and then mutate it inside this function. And then it would be, also, it would be returning a closure, but it would also be mutating global state, so it's yeah, kind of. Issue. I mean, there's a lot of functional dogma out there that uh, there is no such thing as an actual practical application of a purely functional code base. That in the end, something needs to go to a database, needs to go to the screen, needs to go to you know microserver, you know whatever, right? Yes. 
Could you maybe talk um, briefly about the interaction between closure and bind? Uh, and the bind statement? Yeah, or so like if I have a function that has closure and then I bind it to something, like does that impact the closure? Like what's going on there? Are those independent concepts or those related concepts? Um, I actually don't know. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Handle that one. It might be easier to do that one. Like maybe we could do that in another talk because it'd be good to have some code where you could see it. My my guess would be it just has to do with this, yeah. but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Basically, all bind does is like when you call these functions, you can call them on their own like this, where you're not calling them on an object. But a lot of the time too, like it is an object-oriented language, and so you'll call a function on an object where you have like you know a dot add or something like that, like object dot add. And that works 90% 90 of the time until you use that function as like a callback or something. And so if you take that function and kind of detach it from the object and pass it uh, like as a callback or something, when it gets called later, it's not going to know about the object it's attached to. And so all of the times that you talk about this in the function aren't going to work. They'll just be on set, you'll have all these errors. So a while back they introduced uh, a new method on every function where you can go and call bind on it. And it basically takes the function and almost rewrites it so that when it's called, there's kind of an assumed thing where it attaches to a specific instance of an object or something like that so that the this will be set and then you can use it for callbacks and things like that. So you see it in React code bases a lot and times when you're working with callbacks. So, so do you know, does it, does it maintain the rest of the closure and it's only this that's impacted by the bind? Yeah, so the closure would be attached to the function itself um, and then this would just be, it's almost like an invisible argument that comes in to the function. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you could create your own bind function by following this, except that rather than the parameter being come through, it's the this value that comes through the uh, closure. But by having it in a built-in way, you don't have to deal with these nested functions to uh, create that closure for yourself. Probably stop there. All right, thanks, Carl. Exchange JS is Edmonton's JavaScript meetup. Thanks to our sponsors, Jobber and Investopedia. Support the meetup and like and share this video. And stay informed by following us on Twitter and meetup.com. Links in the description. See you soon!